Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Radical Embodiment, Living Well with Lipedema is the name of a seven part series. This is the second in the series. And um, we'll be doing one a month for the rest of the year. So today, radical self-care. Let me say that again. Radical self-care. For many of us, self-care tends to be on the radical side. At least I'm talking for myself personally because it's something I've had to learn and implement and really put some attention on. So befriending your body, our bodies, really. Learning to love yourself. And food that loves you back with a low-carb ketogenic way of eating. So that may seem like two different things. But let me say that one of the most important ways of befriending our bodies, and for those of us who have dealt with lipedema and lymphedema and different levels of obesity, food that nurtures us, it can be a challenging relationship. And I'm happy to say that we're going to have uh, go into that in a little more depth today. So I am going to start up. So a shout out to the many sponsors who make the work at LEARN possible. Their generous support is really the underpinnings of us being able to be here today. So thank you to each and every one of these sponsors. And just a disclaimer, um, which is that any information that we share with you today is provided for use for you in consultation with your healthcare professional. It's not meant to take the place of healthcare or services you may need. Simply put, please see your primary healthcare provider about any of your personal health concerns. And we're going to start with. As I said, our title is really twofold, befriending your body and a ketogenic way of eating, which I truly believe and our research points to is a way to nurture. Let me say that again, nurture, nurture our bodies. Um, so um, I have no conflicts to report and our agenda for today. Um, I'm going to just touch in briefly on living with chronic illness, because those of us with lymphatic disorders, we have a chronic illness. And in the context of lipedema and lymphedema and other related comorbidities, because, you know, that's part of the whole package we deal with. And I think the most important thing that I hope you walk away with from today is this notion of self-compassion. I'm gonna be talking about self-love, self-compassion. How do we relate to our bodies? I also wanna warn you, I am probably gonna cry at some point, I usually do. But the other side of that is we have the wonderful um, Carrie Reedy, who is a clinical nutritionist, as well as a functional medicine specialist in the area of nutrition. She's gonna be talking to us about all the different flavors of keto. And then we have a Q and A. So you're gonna see at the bottom of your window, a place to put questions. Please, as we go through our presentations, put your questions there so that we can answer them at the end of the act presentation itself. This is our holistic model. I'm gonna talk about it very briefly. One of the things that we discovered a number of years ago is that any one component was not enough to allow our ladies, our lipedema ladies to experience enough healing to live well with a chronic disease. That in fact, physical, extremely important, but not solo. 
that the mental, psychological, emotional, spiritual, and social aspects were all critical for our healing and our ability to live well in our bodies and with ourselves and with each other. And so this is a quote that I use pretty much in almost any presentation that I do. I believe this is the work we do, whether it's in any one of the components that I mentioned, but this is at the core. And I said to my body softly, I want to be your friend. It took a long breath and replied, I have been waiting my whole life for this. I'm going to read it again. <laughs> and I said to my body softly, I want to be your friend. It took a long breath and replied, I have been waiting my whole life for this. For those of us who are dealing with a chronic disease that is physically impactful, this truly, truly is, um, is a pathway befriending our bodies. So my objectives today is to review a little bit about what it's like living with a chronic illness and especially in the context of lipedema and lymphedema. I wanna review some of the components and application of our holistic approach because we have very specific, easy actions that you can walk away at 1.05 p.m. today, Eastern time, <laughs> depending on where you are in the world, um, and have something you can do that can make your life better. That's what we're all about. Um, and I want to review some interventions um, and that are gentle, self-compassion, how we can heal body and soul. Okay, a little bit about me. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Lipedema Simplified and the Lipedema Project. I've produced and directed a documentary film called The Disease They Call Fat and co-authored a book of the same title. My background, I have a PhD in media psychology. My research and dissertation was all about media's effect, impact, objectification of women in our bodies. It was um, an amazing process uncovering so much. Th that is another lecture. Um, I have lipedema, lymphedema, and I've struggled with obesity for over 65 years, and I feel it has been my greatest teacher. Um, um, what it, The last piece it said there is I'm a storyteller. So a lot of what I've done is over the past 10 years is I've talked to people literally all over the world, and I've put it together into a narrative for us for those of us who have the diseases to live our lives better. So what is chronic illness? Well, you know, it's something that's just not going away. It's persisting and long lasting. It can progress in severity over time. It has complex causality. If you're dealing with lymphedema, I have surgically induced lip, lip, lymphedema on top of misdiagnosed lipedema. Some of you may have your lymphedema from cancer treatment. Some of you may have your lymphedema from primary lymphedema born with um, malformation. It's, there's so many causality. And the thing is, is most doctors don't know what it is or how to treat it. We're getting better though. There's a long development period. Um, there are some, um, um, lymphatic disorders that develop cancer, cancer surgery, three years later, lymphedema, um, lipedema, puberty, pregnancy, perimenopause, hit with it. Um, you know, it, it's something that doesn't just appear and announce itself. <laughs> There's a prolonged course of illness, and it can often lead to other health complications the comorbidities we have. It's very interesting. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Um, 
did lipedema come first or did obesity come first? Or did obesity come first and then lipedema came next? It's a very complex conversation. It's one that we're doing research into. And there's some kind of functional impairment or disability. Um, I know, and I'm gonna talk about it very briefly, but there was a period where I could barely walk. Um, I was using um, a walker, you know, the whole nine yards. So, but here's the thing that we have that probably 80 to 90% of those with chronic illness don't have. We have visible disfigurement. So, you know, there are people who have chronic fatigue, who might have something else, which are autoimmune disorders, not as visible as those of us with lipedema, lymphedema, and some of the other disorders. So I'm going to um, refer to some studies that were done on the quality of life. So um, there was a study done in the UK. Um, there was several global surveys, a European one, and ours is called Voices of Lipedema. We're in the midst of it now. But here's what we know. Lipedema is unknown, chronic, painful, difficult to control, visible, and disfiguring. Um, most of us try very hard, have tried very hard for years to no avail. So befriending your body, what does it mean? How are we going to do it? <laughs> the very first thing, I happen to love Elizabeth Gilbert. I love her book, Eat, Pray, Love. Um, and so she says, embrace the glorious mess that you are. How can you be with yourself in all of the conflicting um, emotions, um, thoughts, what we want to do, what we try? Well, embrace it, all of it, because all of it is you and your path. So um, this is a quote. I, I'm a professor, and I work with students on their theses, and I used to put this up when I would give my talk on, choose something you're passionate about. What would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? Well, my moment came when I was looking at a wheelchair, when it looked like I was gonna lose the capacity of both of my legs and both of my arms. I didn't think that was such a good option. <laughs> it just didn't seem like a viable pathway for me. So it's what led me in the path of finding out about lipedema and lymphedema. I found out about lymphedema first. And when I went to everything I could to um, treat the lymphedema and what I was doing wasn't working, we finally discovered that it was misdiagnosed lipedema. And, um, you know, lipedema, each one of these women has lipedema, varying stages, varying types, and each one looks unique. So to some degree, I can understand going into a doctor's office where a doctor would look and say, you're fat, you're obese, lose weight, except that this is a pathophysiological process which means that there is an underlying ideology that has to do with a medical condition. And it's not so easy as eat more salad and exercise more. Um, we tried all of that. So I'm so happy to say that we found something that does work. So what we've done is we've created an entire way to help those of us who have lipedema um, to develop actionable implementation plans, to take small micro steps day by day so that we can gently establish self-care, reduce or eliminate weight, volume, pain, swelling, regain mobility or prevent immobility and live at home befriending our bodies. It seems like a tall order. What I want to say, it's very, very simple because it's one step at a time. This is our holistic model, which I went through very briefly. So the interplay amongst these 
um, five dimensions is how we focus and how we suggest that, um, that healing happens. And I just wanna give you one image. This is Marlene. She was not a happy camper. She was in excruciating pain. She'd been trying to get it resolved for years. But the work that we're talking about, she's setting up something that was gonna work for her. We are each unique. This was four months later. And you can see the difference. The difference isn't that she lost a huge amount of weight. The difference is that she found herself and she found a place within herself that she was able to enjoy, to contribute, to be part of life again, is what she said. So what can you know that can make a difference in the quality of your life? So I am gonna um, say that our process is just that you keep putting one foot in front of the other, and then one day you look back and you've created your own pathway, your very own pathway. So I'm going to show this. I've showed it um, last time. This is our model. We have each one of the dimensions and tools within each one of the dimensions. And I want to say at the core of our tools is community. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. Community is nurturing, mentoring is supportive, and knowledge is powerful because ultimately it's through self-care and us being able to listen to our bodies that will move us in a direction. I'm one that believes in signs. So um, in the midst of one of my most challenging times, a friend of mine took me to this wonderful little cafe here in Cambridge. It's called Life Alive, Whole Foods, um, Green Drinks, and in the bathroom, <laughs> there was this painted in the bathroom. I took a picture of this because you never know where you're going to find a sign. And the sign came in the toilet. And um, you are doing the impossible. And of course, I had to find out what the quote said. And the quote said, but start by doing what is necessary, then what is possible. And suddenly you're doing the impossible didn't look like I was going to be able to walk again. I want you to know I am now walking. And here's another impossibility for some of us. You might not be like me. I mean, you might be able to look in the mirror and be happy with what you see. I know that I wasn't. I'm more so now, but I wasn't. And so, you know, part of the process was learning what you know, what's the pathway? What's that one step after the other? What's the possible so that maybe at some point the impossible becomes a reality? And so self-compassion is what I found to be the answer. Self-compassion. Sorry, I crying is part of, <laughs> no matter what, I always end up a little teary. Um, so, First step, there's resistance. I mean, resistance is when you're pushing against something, where it becomes hard. Welcome it. The resistance, um, you know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross went through this amazing process around death and dying, and it's the same thing. There is a form of death because you know, your body is changing. It's never going to be the same. But welcoming it, it's possible to let it go and to be with yourself in the present moment. And the second step is to trust in a higher power, whatever you call it. Call it, you know, God, um, the force, the universe. I call it the universe. <laughs> that you will be taken care of. One of the things that I noticed when I was in the midst of my challenges was that I had made it until that moment. I had, I had survived some really hard times and that the only thing that I was being invited to do was take the very next step. And that trust led me in directions. Oh my God. I mean, literally all over the world. 
allow yourself to feel the thing that for me was so important was to feel the grief. There was profound grief. But as I learned to let that go, I began to experience such a deep expression about this body, what this body had gone through, what this body had survived, and how it housed me. Because without it, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> it's like that was my big realization. Hmm, without my body, I'm not going to be here. <laughs> What's the choice? So that allowing those feelings, they pass. They don't stay. They pass when you allow yourself to feel them. And so much was about forgiveness. Um, I was so angry at my healthcare providers for so long. And I finally started to open up the door to solutions when I was able to let go and just forgive a healthcare system that at best is broken. And this one, be your own best friend. You know, um, you and I, and I say this having worked with literally thousands of lipedema ladies all over the world, the lipedema ladies are the best at helping one another and not the best at being there for themselves. And so one of the things that we do again and again and again is we bring it back. Start here, like on the airplane where they say, put your mask on before you put the mask on anyone else. You're putting your own mask on and being present for yourself. And gratitude. Um, I feel like I'm sharing more personally than I usually share today, but one of the things that I found when I was in the, again, height of the challenges, just being grateful for the smallest things that came into my life every day. Someone asked me recently, what would I do? Would I trade off having lipedema if I could? And I had to think about it because if I didn't have lipedema, I would not know you. And knowing you and having you in my life is so precious. The relationships that have formed, the community that thrives in supporting one another. So I have profound gratitude for that. And practice, practice, practice. Well, what are we practicing? Well, for those of us who have disfigurement to deal with, we're practicing to looking and loving. So a couple of affirmations. I have many, but I just chose a couple. Um, and uh, one of the things I always tell everyone, make up your own. In your own words is so much more powerful. But here are three affirmations. Every day, in every way, I love and accept myself more and more. Change it. The words aren't important. Even if you just look at yourself in the mirror and say, hey, kid, you're doing okay today. Every day in every way, I get better and better. I am, this is one of my favorites. I am madly and deeply in love with myself and my body. This was the biggest stretch, but it was one that was worth encountering. It was one that was worth taking on. So I'm going to finish up with, yeah, I am. Okay. So we had something called the Real You Project, which was about us delving into befriending our bodies. I'm not one that likes pictures of myself. We had a photographer, one of the best photo um, portrait photographers, headshot photographers. His name is Peter Hurley. He came and he did a photo shoot for a group of lipedema ladies. And I want you to prepare yourself because I think we look like models. But um, the first picture that I went, oh, my God, I can see myself. And so could all the other women. Um, each one of us having an opportunity to step into ourselves and reveal a deeper part of who we each are here to ourselves and to our worlds. 
So um, it was quite an experience to say the least. And I'm gonna end with this. It's from a, a book on our body is not an apology is the name of the book. Radical self-love summons us to be our most expansive selves, knowing that the more unflinchingly powerful we allow ourselves to be, the more unflinchingly powerful others feel capable of being. Our unapologetic embrace of our bodies gives others permission to unapologetically embrace theirs. Our bodies are where we live. No, they're not perfect. No, they've been through very hard times, most of us. But the more we can honor them, the more they will be there for us. And so on that note, I'm going to turn this over to Carrie and introduce her. Carrie's a clinical nutritionist and a functional medicine practitioner. She has a specialty in lipedema and lymphatic disorders. She's certified in ketogenic low carb um, through the, uh, 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 oh my goodness, um, uh, Tim Noakes, through the Noakes Foundation in South Africa. And she's a coach and facilitator with Lipedema Simplified. But she wants you all to know she's the mom of six kids. She, that her kids range in age from 30 years old to seven. And on that note, I'm going to turn this over to Carrie, who's going to share with us what I think is very critical. It's the next action step that I feel helps the most people. Hi, and uh, thank you, Catherine, for handing the baton over to me. I could have sat and listened to you for ages. I, I love the um, just the empathy that you show as you talk to um, the lipedema and lymphedema community about your personal journey and certainly about um, all the wisdom that you have to share. I'm just going to start sharing my screen, so just bear with me for a moment. There we go. Okay. So you can see my screen, I hope. What we're going to be, what I'm going to be talking a little bit about today, um, Catherine's already introduced this model that she um, and the Lipedema community have come up where we have, you know, the physical aspect, the emotional, the mental, spiritual, and social. And as a functional nutritionist, I'm very much about looking at ourselves holistically. And so this is one of the things that I just loved when, um, I met Catherine and, and this organization because I think it's really important that we don't just focus on one aspect of our health, but we think about how all of these factors come together. Now we know with lipedema that the manual therapies, and this comes into the physical section, the manual therapies can be really beneficial. We need to have physical activity. We need to be focusing on some of these lifestyle type things, you know, making sure we're getting good sleep, um, managing our stress, maintaining good hydration. And we also know, of course, that our food choices matter. And, and I, I sort of want to preface what I want to say is that I'm really mindful that many in the lipedema and lymphedema community have a long history of struggling with how they feel about themselves, about their weight. You know, they've potentially tried all sorts of methods already to, to manage these circumstances. And most of them have found that dietary practices don't really benefit them a great deal, um, certainly the ones that they've potentially tried in the past. So um, when I first, whoops, Daisy, it's not doing its thing. So when I first um, was introduced to lipedema, and, and let me just preface, this is not something that I learned about when I studied nutrition at university. Lymphedema got mentioned maybe, you know, maybe about five minutes lipedema wasn't mentioned at all. So when I learned about this condition, I felt like I was going down the rabbit hole. I had a few clients came to me all within a matter of a few weeks, and they seem to all have this cluster of symptoms that we now know are typical of lipedema, the disproportionate fat accumulation in their lower limbs, the pain, the swelling, the discomfort, the, the frequent bruising, the inability to lose weight. And that really sent me down this rabbit hole. And that's where ultimately I met uh, Leslie and Keith and um, Catherine and others in the community. What impressed me so much about Lipedema Simplified was the fact that they looked at this holistically. It wasn't just about 
here's a condition, here's this one protocol, everyone needs to do this protocol, this is the solution. It was more looking at people's lives individually and helping them come up with a way of managing their circumstances in a way that worked for them. So um, what we're going to talk about a little bit is uh, initially, what is, many women are told with lipedema is that diet, and, diet and, and exercise don't make any difference. You know, typically in terms of dietary recommendations for someone that's trying to lose weight, we you know, engage in that eat, eat less, exercise more kind of mindset. And what we know with lipedema in particular, it doesn't respond to this. But what we do know, thanks to the work of Leslin and Catherine, and anecdotally many around the world now with this condition is that a lower carbohydrate way of eating is actually starting to show some real positive benefits. You know, initially it was a bit of a hypothesis, like, you know, is this going to work? But as more and more ladies have, have tested this out, they've really found some profound benefits. And the reasons that we've now discovered that lowering carbohydrates are because eating in this way reduces one, the exposure to many of the inflammatory compounds in our food supply. Um, as a functional nutritionist, it, it concerns me um, that our food supply is so, um, I, I would say, adulterated these days. You know, it's full of processed, refined foods that our bodies don't recognize so well as food, and they certainly don't know how to process them. So by eating in a lower carbohydrate way, we tend to take out all of those processed foods and we're eating more natural, real foods. We also know that by doing this, um, we are going to potentially go into a ketogenic state. When we lower our carbohydrates to a certain point, our body then shifts from using um, glucose as its fuel source to using ketones. And these ketones are in fact highly anti-inflammatory. And so their process and the things that they do in the body lead to a lowering of pain and improving any discomfort. We know that taking in some higher levels of fat than typically we've been used to over the last 50 years also has some positive benefits. We suspect that this is because the higher fat is actually helping uh, lymph vessel integrity and improving lymph flow. Anyone that's sort of my age or, or around there or older, would know that through the sort of the 80s, 90s, um, we were told avoid fat at all costs. You know, that's when we moved into, you know, eating low fat foods or diet foods or, you know, all of these things. And I, I really do wonder whether there, there's a significant role there on, on for so long women thinking they needed to lower their fat intake in their diet to try and lose weight has actually impacted the progression of a lot of conditions like lipedema. What we also know is that a ketogenic way of eating, and that, that means a very low carbohydrate way of eating, often improves all sorts of other um, associated symptoms. You know, it improves our energy level, it reduces uh, potentially brain fog, it has a positive impact on swelling. Uh, it certainly can help with weight loss, but, you know, as a nutritionist, my focus with my clients initially is let's Let's get healthy and then allow the weight loss to happen. You know, let's get you feeling better so that you can move your body more, so that you can function at, at a higher level, and then the weight loss potentially will come along. We also know that by improving this, what we call metabolic flexibility, that we end up with a whole lot of positive health benefits all the way along the line. So these are just some reasons that we know that lowering carbohydrate intake can have some really positive um, benefits for those with lipedema and also um, with associated lymphatic conditions. Now, there's many flavors of keto. And so I, 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 I don't know why I picked a picture of ice cream to put on this slide, because it's probably the, the least keto food out there. But I really, I, I guess when I thought about, you know, something that there's lots of flavors of, you know, ice cream came to mind. And what we're talking about in terms of the way to do a ketogenic diet to help with lipedema and lymphatic conditions isn't just your typical internet keto that you might jump online and you might look it up and go, oh, I'm going to try a keto diet for a couple of weeks. And you'll see, you know, specific macros, really sort of intense rules and regulations about what you're doing. 
whilst you know all all of these flavors have their benefits i think what we're finding most specifically works for lipedema and these other lymphatic conditions is very much a simplified way of eating keto we want to be focusing on whole foods so uh, meat vegetables healthy fats we want to be eating real food and that means avoiding those processed foods you know walking around the edge of the supermarket to do your shopping, you know, in the fresh food produce section, in the meats, potentially in the dairy cabinet, we need to make sure that we're eating enough protein. Another thing that I find is really common in ladies with, with these sorts of conditions is they have spent so much of their time dieting for, you know, over years and years and years, and they've lowered their calorie intake and they've lowered their protein intake and there's some real ramifications in their health as well. So focusing on getting enough protein is really important. Getting those healthy fats in is also extremely important. Every cell in our body has fat around its outside membrane. And if we're not eating healthy fats, or we're, again, on the flip side of that is we're, we're actually eating a lot of unhealthy fats, we're going to have unhealthy cell membranes. And we need our cell membranes to be healthy because they do so, such an important job uh, for us. And I really do wonder how much this lower fat intake that we've had over the last you know, 40, 50 years has contributed to some of the complications we're experiencing now. It's also important that we focus on a way of eating keto where we can experiment a little bit, where we think about, you know, maybe for most people, nuts are great, but maybe for us, they're not so good. Maybe dairy is great for other people, but for us, it's not so good. You know, what are the right sort of healthy fats for us to be eating? And I think we need to um, approach this from the mindset of, of thinking that we're all an experiment of one. What works for one person may not necessarily work for us. And so when we're trying to navigate around a ketogenic way of eating, we really do need to work out what flavor works for us and for our particular health goals. We know that uh, some people do need to go dairy free. Some people need to go egg free. Some people focus more on a carnivore way of doing keto, which is more specifically focusing on, on meats and potentially dairy in there. But it, it really is working out what works for you. And so the way that I encourage people to, to test out keto is to bring it right back keep it really simple, focus on these whole foods like I mentioned, and then really test it out. I actually encourage people to take a bit of an inventory of how they're feeling before they start their experiment. And then, you know, four weeks in, eight weeks in, 12 weeks in, look and compare, you know, how are my symptoms going? What am I seeing benefits in? I think this can be really motivating as we try and change the way that we're doing things especially when it's kind of feels like it's a bit of a like a, a 180 from what we've been eating in the past it's really good to have this um, ability to quantify the improvements that we're experiencing and that gives us then that scope to test out and see what other tweaks we might need to make in our ketogenic diet to make it really work for us and the reason that we want to do this along the same lines as Catherine was speaking we are worth it you know, it might sound like from what I'm talking about, there's a little bit of work involved in this. And, and I would say right from the onset, changing the way that we're doing things, you know, it can be work, but we certainly are worth it. And like Catherine said about putting on our oxygen mask first, if we really spend a bit of time and, and are able to tweak the diet and, and, and make our way of eating really beneficial to us, we then have the energy and, and ability to then go on and help other people, but we need to focus on getting ourselves right first. Now, one of the things that I just wanted to briefly mention to you, uh, and this I talk from experiencing as a nutritionist working with lots and lots of people, but there is a diet cycle. And I'm sure as I go through this cycle, many of you will think, oh yeah, that's incredibly familiar to me. <laughs> um, but many of us start this cycle wanting to lose weight. So then we start dieting, we look around to find the, the latest, you know, bad diet that's out there. We, we jump on the bandwagon of whatever that's going to be. You know, we get some initial success, which gives us that sense of reward. And that kind of keeps us motivated for, you know, weeks. It can be motivated for months. 
But eventually we find that willpower just doesn't cut it anymore. You know, we feel deprived. We may feel like it's all too hard. And then one day, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back, something happens. We're like, oh, that's it. I give in. I'm just going to go back to eating what I was eating before. We then end up in this cycle of feeling disappointed with ourselves. We potentially put on a little bit of weight. You know, we can then go back to emotional eating and we then kind of get frustrated and then we go back around and around and around the cycle. And, and many of the women that I work, work with, they're like, yep, I have been through that cycle so, so, so many times. And each time it just gets harder to get back on the horse, if you like, and go through the cycle again. What I would say to you is when I'm talking today about eating in a ketogenic way, I'm not talking about just jumping on one more diet. I'm talking about changing the way that we're eating. And so I don't even refer to it as the ketogenic diet, if I possibly can. I like to talk about it as being a ketogenic way of eating. We're talking about a way of eating that can help us break free from this diet cycle, that we're not feeling like we're either 100% doing our diet or 100% off. You know, we're thinking about a new way of eating that's going to support us and our health goals. And I think that can be really beneficial. You know, we know that um, the way that we eat can affect all sorts of other aspects of our health. And we also know that um, we need to address some of these other areas as, as well. So whilst I was specifically invited to talk tonight about the physical aspect of the way that we're eating, uh, the ketogenic uh, way of doing things, I also just briefly want to jump in and talk to you a little bit about stress. And this kind of, I guess, comes from the emotional aspect, but we are living in challenging times. You know, think the pandemic's kind of coming to, to an end, but it just still all feels a little bit up in the air. So it's been quite stressful for many of us. And the stress generated by simply having a chronic health condition also contributes to all sorts of um, health challenges. We, we talk about inflammation a lot in lipedema. And we know that when we're stressed, this is a pro-inflammatory uh, process that happens in the body. So I just briefly want to talk about the stress and, and another little aspect that can really help us understand a little bit more about the connection between our emotional and our physical. So I'm really um, fascinated by the work of um, a Dr. Stephen Porges. He's a, um, a psychiatrist and he's come up with um, what he calls his polyvagal theory. Now, most of us are familiar with our nervous system and we, we, we hear about things like, oh, I'm in fight or flight, I'm so stressed out, I'm in fight or flight, or you know, everything's calm and we're in that rest and digest state. Our nervous system is constantly like a radar. It is constantly looking around our environment to see what's going on. It's assessing that information and it's really relaying information and saying, yes, you're safe right now, or no, you're in danger, you need to be in this fight or flight. But what Dr. Paul just refers to is that there's a third state. And he talks about this as being um, immobilized or shut down or frozen. So either we are in this state of safety, or we're actually in one of these other two states. And I'm just going to briefly explain this to you. Because what he says is, when we're feeling safe, our body is in a, a balanced homeo, um, homeostasis and health-wise things are going along quite well. Our body's able to you know, step in and do what it needs to. But when we're either in this danger, the fight or flight state, or we're immobilized and shut down, this is where we start to see the development of all types of chronic health concerns. And Catherine's already spoken so eloquently about you know, lipedema, lymphatic conditions, these are all chronic health conditions. And I, I kind of just like to kind of put a little bit of a, a little bit of understanding around this, thinking that when we're stressed, the physical manifestations of that, typically we are anxious. Our brain needs to be thinking really, really fast to be able to get us out of danger. We become sensitive to sounds, our blood pressure might go up, we might experience you know, more post-traumatic stress type situations. But if we're not in that fight or flight trying to get away, but we're more in this sort of shut down, immobilized, I'm, I'm so overwhelmed with my stress that I'm sort of coming right back into myself. I sort of think about it in terms of 
um, we sort of, you know, sort of fold back into ourselves, we're more likely to see other sorts of health manifestations. So chronic uh, fatigue, fibromyalgia, digestive concerns, our mood, rather than being very anxious, our mood is more flat and depressed. And interestingly, our blood pressure can go down with this as well. But these are more, this next slide talks a little bit more about that, the state of mind. So when we're in this safe zone, we're open and curious about the world. But when we're in fight or flight, we can be angry or anxious, as you can imagine, trying to get away, right? Um, when we're in the immobilized state, we have more feelings of despair and we feel like we can't. And so the reason that I share all of this is because it really plays into our understanding that when we're thinking about our physical health, we need to appreciate what our nervous system is doing in the background of all of these things. And so all of this is controlled by what we call the vagus nerve. Now, the vagus nerve runs from the back of our, um, our, our brain, sort of at the top of our, um, our spinal column, all the way down. If you see this little picture here, the yellow depicts this vagus nerve. And you'll see that the nerve comes through, but it has all these branches that go out to our lungs, to our heart, to our digestive system, to potentially even further on down to our reproductive system. This vagus nerve talks to everywhere in our body. And so when it's stimulated because we're in fight or flight or we're uh, in this immobilized state, there's a lot of activity going on in our nervous system. And so what we can do is think about ways that we can positively impact our vagus nerve. And our vagus nerve is actually really sensitive to things that are going on in our environment, but we can also tone it up if you like. I sort of say to people, it's a little bit like a, a muscle, even though it's a nerve. Think about it in terms of what would you do if you had a weak muscle, you would do some exercise to strengthen it. What we can do is strengthen our vagus nerve. And I just wanted to give you uh, a few little tips and tricks and things that people can do just to try and kind of calm down this, this nervous response. And you'll often hear us talking about things like um, di diaphragmatic breathing, you know, that breathing where you're breathing right down into your belly, because this does have a beautiful calming effect on the body. But in terms of the vagus nerve, there's a few other things that we can do. Singing, humming, gargling, these sorts of things are great. So sometimes, you know, when you're feeling stressed out, if you can just, you know, hum or think about your favorite song, I, I personally love the acoustics in my car. In my car, I actually think I have a great voice. <laughs> But everywhere else, I know that I can't sing. But in the privacy of my car, I think about in terms of what I'm doing to uh, help tone up my vagus nerve. There are some other interesting programs around. The Safe and Sound program is actually a listening program that stimulates the vagus nerve via the nerves in our ear canal, which is quite fascinating. But some of these other practices you may have had some experience with and know that they do, in fact, help you get back into this more balanced state. So listening to soothing music, yoga, uh, mindful and meditation practices. Interestingly, anything that we can do to help the gut actually helps the vagus nerve because this is two-way communication between the brain and all of these organs in this picture here. And so anything that we're doing to strengthen anything else in our body will have some positive benefits too. But I love the last part, and this comes back to some of the things that Catherine was talking about, connecting with community, connecting with other people, connecting with like-minded people that are going through similar circumstances to ourselves is actually really calming and has some really positive benefits to our health as well. So talking about that physical aspect, we really do need to think about, yes, the way that we eat, but also all of these other aspects as well. So over the coming months, months, as you'll know, Catherine's always already mentioned that each month we'll be doing one of these uh, webinars with LEARN. But for today, what I want you to think about is the role of nutrition and a nutritional approach, potentially testing out how a low carbohydrate way of eating can help with your condition. That's certainly something that I would like you to consider. But I'd also like you to take on board what I've just been mentioning about the role that stress is playing and how this actually has an impact on our health as well, particularly um, when we're stressed and we're in that fight or flight or we're in that shutdown, the role that that has on our, on our, on our gut, 
the role that it has on other organ systems in our body. And I hazard to guess it plays a huge role in the way that our lymphatics system works as well. That research is still to be done. And I know that that's something that is being considered to be done in terms of um, when we're thinking about this polyvagal theory. But really, I just want you to appreciate the role that everything in the body is interconnected and this whole holistic model that Lipedema Simplified um, encourages us to adopt is really something that all of us can adopt in our everyday life in all sorts of aspects. So I think we're sort of at the end of um, what I had to share, Catherine. Are you going to jump back on? I think we're going to. I have um, one final quote that I want to give people because, you know, at this point in time, um, go ahead. Yeah. In, in this point in time, often people are saying, oh, my God, what do I do? Well, let me say that the thing that we do is not doing. So let me share this one last quote that says, <clears throat> okay, your task is not to seek for love or beauty, merely to seek and find all the barriers in yourself that you've built against it. So when we talk about love and compassion, and um, you know, when you look at a child, when you look at an infant, there's not all of that just self-judgment, self-critical, um, it, but it's just to get back to that essence, which is within each and every one of us. I just love that. So I just wanted to leave that as the last thing. And, um, and we can take Q&A. So I'm going to, um, I open the Q&A. So what are your thoughts on using plant-based dairy to go dairy-free? Or is it just better to get used to eating without dairy, including the dairy mm. substitutes? <laughs> that for you, Gary. Oh, that's such a great question. And I, I, um, I, I'm a purist and I, I guess I would probably err on what you said, Catherine, that rather than trying to replace a, a real food with a manufactured food, I would say if you can't eat dairy because you know that for some reason dairy just doesn't agree with you, you're probably better just finding some, some alternatives to that that you, you do enjoy, that you can eat. Many of the um, plant-based substitutes are just full of all sorts of processed things. They're potentially going to have some damaged oils in there um, due to the processing of them. Um, if they were like a sometimes, like an every every now and then thing, you know, it might be something that later on you could test out and see how you respond to. But I would hazard to guess if you were to turn those packages over that there would be so many ingredients in there and so many numbers of, you know, of chemicals. I, I would just be very wary. If you found something that just had two or three really natural ingredients in it, then that might be a different story. But definitely we want to be, uh, really sort of minimizing the amount of processed foods in the diet because they are just playing havoc with our health. My rule, my rule of thumb has been when I read a label, if I can't pronounce it, don't eat it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a couple more. Um, so someone, and I want to just add a little bit to this, which is, is tomato paste or canned tomatoes okay? If you can eat tomatoes, Yes, and I say that because I'm Italian by um, heritage. I love Italian food. And when I had to stop eating all the carbs, which I did many, many years ago, I put tomato sauce on everything. And if it wasn't tomato sauce, it was salsa, it was whatever. It's all fine, except that I finally uncovered that I have um, an allergy to nightshades and tomatoes are a nightshade. And that's why I say this. Um, I still eat tomatoes, but I always shore up because I know two hours later, I'm gonna feel like I got hit by a Mack truck. So, so you, 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 you pick and choose your battles. Mm. Uh, you wanna add something to that, Carrie? Oh, no, I was just gonna say that nightshades, you know, typically, um, are associated with pain that people do feel it as, as pain and one of the things that we experience with lipedema is pain and so um, that's sort of one that I don't always advocate that people remove it initially um, it's one that 
you know, because it does add lots of flavor to our food and it's things that we typically love, these sorts of foods that you've mentioned. Um, but if after a couple of weeks, you know, we, we sort of talk about it, you know, and think, hmm, that pain hasn't really subsided like we, we had hoped, then we might say, well, let's just test out a couple of weeks without um, any tomatoes or their friends, you know, um, egg, I call them eggplants here in Australia. I think you call them aubergines um, and capsicum. They're also in that same family of foods. If someone's intolerant to nightshades, they may find that they, you know, have reactions to all of those. Fabulous. Thank you. And there's um, two other um, keto related questions, and I'm going to give you both of them. Is oh. <laughs> olive oil okay or any oils? That's one. And the second one has to do with how to do keto and maintain being a vegetarian. Oh, two other wonderful questions. So, yes, um, I, I'm quite happy with people to eat um, olive oil. I also avocado oil, macadamia oil, both of those uh, are healthy oils as well. The oil, the fat that comes in our food, so saturated fat. For a long time, we've been very averse to saturated fat, but actually that's quite fine as well. But olive oil certainly is a great one to add in to make salad dressings, those sorts of things. Now, in terms of can you do keto as a vegetarian, um, I think it would be very hard to do it if you were vegan, but I think as vegetarian, it, it is possible. The thing that's a challenge is that um, most people that have have eating in a vegetarian way have eaten a lot of plant-based carbohydrates in the past like they've used more beans and pulses those sorts of things to um, get enough protein because I'm very much an advocate of eating sufficient protein for ourselves we've got to be a little bit more creative in terms of how to get that protein in each day because we do initially as we try and lower those carbohydrates we do have to lower the amount of um, vegetables and other things in the diet initially before we start to play around with it. So it is more tricky. It really needs to be done with a little bit more guidance. And I even sort of occasionally talk to my clients and say, well, okay, you know, if are, are you good with fish? Are you good with eggs? I think it depends on the level of being a vegetarian. Um, of you know, if you do dairy, you know, you certainly have more scope in there. Um, but happy to have a chat to anyone about that if if they want to talk about that anymore after the call. Great. Thanks, Carrie. We have a couple more um, uh, keto related questions, but we also have a few lipedema. So I'm going to juggle them up a little bit. Um, oh. so someone wants to know about like liposuction for lipedema. For those who are good candidates for liposuction, there have been very positive results. Not everyone is a candidate for liposuction um, with lipedema. There are some of us who have lipedema and lymphedema, and there are some who have just straight lipedema. Those with lipedema tend to do much better with the surgery. There's also been some unexpected um, complications, which include that the fat does seem to grow back in other areas. So fat that's removed from the legs can show up in the breasts, in the back, in the torso, and, but it sometimes takes a while for that to happen. There's been a number of studies um, with liposuction and the fat growing back, not necessarily just with lipedema. So what I always say to people is do your homework. Um, you know, there are people who are having very good results. There are also people I know of a number of amputations and I know of several deaths from the liposuction. Cause so it's just to say, really do your homework. Number one, you have to be a good candidate. Make sure that the surgeon is a match for you, that you set your expectations realistically. Um, even with liposuction, there's still a certain level of disfigurement depending on what stage you are and where you remain. So um, I, I hope that that helps give you a little bit of information, Laura. Okay. Um, there was another one here. How do you know if you have lipedema or obesity? That is an excellent question and one that's asked a lot. In obesity, the fat tends to be soft tissue, which means if you take, you know, okay, you guys see my arms. Um, if you take this, this is the bat wing. Um, this is a laxity. What happens in lipedema is the, um, 
the tissue becomes very lax. It loses its elasticity. So that's one way you can tell. The other way you can tell is when you take it and you actually um, roll it around, you can feel nodules. Um, what it is, is that there is um, scar tissue that grows around the fat tissue and it's called fibrosis. And so lipedema fat tends to be fibrotic. So there's fibrosis, there's pain. Not always, not in 100% of the cases, but in many of the cases. There's bruising. There's something that's called capillary fragility, which means that the, um, the veins, the capillaries in the veins are very fragile. And so you can be walking and you look down and you see this huge black and blue and you're like, how the heck did I get that? I don't remember anything. It can be something so light. Um, that you don't even remember it and you end up with a hematoma. So um, we have, if you go to lipedemaproject.org, there is a quiz on the page that asks nine simple questions and it gives a fairly um, good uh, guesstimate that you might or might, might not have it. Um, oh, I could go on and on about this. I'm gonna say one more thing and stop. Um, obesity tends to respond to calorie restriction. Lipedema does not. Let me say that again. If you have obesity, which is usually excess weight that is somewhat, somewhat, I don't say always, but somewhat related to intake and outtake, when you restrict, you can have a, um, you can have a change. Not so for those of us with lipedema. You know, we might have a very minor change or some from the upper body, not the lower body. I know of a number of women who've had bariatric surgery, had gastric sleeve and lost some weight, but n hardly anything from the lower body, which is where lipedema tends to appear. Mm -hmm. So I hope that gave you a little bit. Um, okay, here's another one, Karia, for you. Um, why nuts, eggs, Keto carnivore, wait a second, let me get this whole question. To experiment within the keto diet, what might one be looking for when choosing to experiment or to evaluate experimenting? Great, mm. great, great. Absolutely fantastic question. Um, so when I explained before that uh, the way that I encourage people to, to test out whether a ketogenic diet or ketogenic way of eating is working for them is we give them a like, you know, I, I give a fairly sort of structured way of doing it for, you know, four, six weeks, and then we reassess. And that's where we then think, well, how much benefit has happened? And if we haven't got as much benefit as we would like, or it doesn't feel like it's, it's, you know, giving you, you know, that, that idea that this is going to be beneficial for you. That's where we then start to think, well, okay, is there something that you're still including in your current ketogenic way of eating that's not actually agreeing with you. But say, for instance, someone says, um, you know, my pain feels better or my swelling seems better, but I'm getting a lot of gut symptoms. You know, my, my digestion doesn't feel good. Then we start to think, well, is there a food in there? Is, are you lactose intolerant? So all that dairy is causing you some issues, that sort of thing. And so that's how we then ultimately test it out. We do know for for many women, oh, I shouldn't say women, but you know, those that are embarking on a ketogenic way of eating, it's if you include nuts, it's very hard to control them. <laughs> you know, it's like a handful and then another handful and another handful. So initially we recommend, you know, steering clear of those. Um, there's a few other keto-friendly foods that we sort of say steer clear of because they're easy to overeat. We really want to give it the best shot. One of the things that I find even in the lipedema community is I'll talk to women and they'll say, oh, I've tried keto. I've, you know, I've tried it in the past. I did it for a couple of weeks and it didn't work. And when we start to kind of break down, how did they do keto? What was their experience? You know, we, we, we come to see that maybe there was some, you know, they weren't necessarily in ketosis or they weren't necessarily getting the benefits because some of these foods were included and so we kind of keep it really simple in the early stages. We can play around with it a little bit later. And so, yes, we can um, test out where the dairy works, where the eggs work, whether all of these things work, um, but we have to kind of do it step by step by step. And I do find that works much more successfully for people because it, it in many ways it works like a elimination diet because you're taking a lot of those more complex foods out 
you're eating a fairly basic whole real food diet and then you can start playing around with it a little bit later on and see how your particular body responds because there is no one size fits all. Catherine, you've had some interesting experiences. You've done like a, a standard ketogenic diet, but you've now sort of tested the waters of a bit more carnivore flavored keto and you're finding some real success with that. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'm going to take what uh, Carrie just said, and I'm going to answer that, but in the context of a couple of the questions, mm -hmm. which is how can you um, tell what works for you? The only way you can tell is by listening to your body. Um, mm -hmm. As Carrie said, you eat something and you check and you see, has there been a reaction? Do you feel bloated? Do you feel in any way, any kind of feedback, you know? And um, are you, are, are you, um, feeling good with what you're eating, I mean, physically good. Those are all questions to ask yourself. Um, so to Carrie's point, I personally did keto. I did low carb. I started low carb in the mid eighties. It's much, wasn't as low carb as I now am, but um, without realizing it, it was, um, it, it helped. It helped my lipedema. I didn't know it at the time, but then when I hit perimenopause, all bets were off and my lipedema just exploded. Um, one of the things, and Carrie's mentioned it a couple of times, is certain foods tend to be inflammatory. When we eat them, the way our bodies respond is by inflammation. What inflammation is, you know, when you cut your finger and it gets red all around, um, you know, it's healing. What, what's happening is there are these um, cells called cytokines and they're coming to the rescue and they're cleaning out the, in any possible infection. Inflammation, swelling. We know swelling, lipedema, lymphedema, swelling, edema. And so certain foods are inflammatory. Now, some of those foods we don't eat, sugar, don't eat that anymore, haven't eaten it for years. We know sugar isn't gonna be good, but here's some other foods that you don't know about, grains, anything that makes flour. So even whole grains, even the good grains are inflammatory for some of us. That's where you have to start listening to your body. Um, and in that process, you will be able to become acutely aware because your body, here's the thing, you know, this notion of befriending your body, your body is always communicating with you. Mm. Always, right now, right this minute, your body, if you put your focus on it, you'll get something that your body's trying to tell you in this moment. And if you are able to listen and adapt accordingly, you'll find yourself growing in health and wellness and being much happier in your body. And some of the ways that happens is it's not necessarily with weight loss. It's with a loss of bloating. There's a bloating that happens, especially if you have sensitivities to dairy. Um, and um, one of the things I discovered is that I'm highly, highly, highly sensitive to carbohydrates. And so, you know what? Brussels sprouts has carbohydrates, one of my favorite vegetables. So I've done an elimination diet and I personally have been on carnivore for the past couple of months. And I was just writing to my support group this morning and saying, oh my God, I don't think I've ever been this low in carbohydrates in my entire life. And in the beginning, when I started this a couple months ago, I'm on day, what, 67, um, 65, <laughs> minute 43, you know? <laughs> um, it, but, I was craving Brussels sprouts and cauliflower. It was crazy. And finally, um, Gail, we, Gail works with us. Um, we all work together. And she said to me, hmm, sounds like you're having carb cravings. I went, what? Are you freaking crazy? Carb cravings? I want broccoli. And sure enough, she was right. So again, you have to listen to your body. We're running over. And I want to thank so much, um, your being here and learn for bringing us in. There are more questions, but let me say that um, our colleagues, Less Than Keith and A.D. McKenzie are coming next month on August 4th. 
same time, noon time, noon time, East Coast time, and accordingly, whatever that time is in your time zone. And they're going to be talking about um, complete decongestive therapies. So um, what you know as uh, manual lymph drainage, wrapping, compression garments, skin care, all of what we need to do for self-care for our bodies and the parts of our bodies that are most affected by these diseases. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Carrie, I love working with you. you I always <laughs> learn something new from you. So thank you. Well, it's been fun to be with you tonight. It's um, appreciate the opportunity and uh, certainly I learn lots from you all the way along as well. You've and certainly taught me about self-compassion and the importance <laughs> of life. Um, so um, thank you all. Thank you, all of the um, LEARN staff. Absolutely pleasure to be here and work with you. Thank you.